Hi, my name is V, and I'm going to be lecturing to you about distributions and resampling today. This is the first lecture of the week for the Fundamentals in Statistics and Computation for Neuroscientists course at UCSD in 2016. All right, so what am I actually going to be talking about? We talked about distributions a little bit already in Tom's lecture, but maybe you're not sure how to model your data distribution. Maybe it doesn't really look quite Poisson or Gaussian or binomial. What do you do? So the first thing you want to do is actually test your distribution. You can see whether it meets the properties of the distribution you suspect it is. And the second set of things I'm going to be talking about are this huge family of methods which use resampling. Basically, you're going to take samples from your data over and over and over again to sort of populate a distribution. And there are many things you can do with resampling. I'll review a little bit of the basics today, and then in the next lecture I will talk much more in detail about other permutation and resampling methods. All right, so first we'll talk about distribution testing, or how do you know if you're really normal? So, is your distribution normal? Often, it actually isn't. <laughs> but how do you actually test whether it's true or not? As we reviewed with the central limit theorem, you can approximate normality if you have enough samples. Typically, the first thing you'll do is plot a histogram and see whether it looks vaguely normal. If it's extremely deviant from normality, the histogram should be able to show you in a quick second. Then we're going to talk about something called quantile-quantile plots. This is just another way to plot your data, and it's a little bit easier to tell whether you have deviations from normality which aren't as extreme using what um, other people call a QQ plot for short. Then we're going to go over some hypothesis tests for normality. So all of these have a bunch of names of some old mathematicians or statisticians, but I'm showing you them here because it's really common for people to refer to these tests by these names specifically. They often don't have other names. So you're just going to have to know what the Kolmogorov Smirnov test is or Shapiro Wilkes or whatever. So there is an issue with histograms. We already learned about how to make them. But you can just imagine the curve on the histogram, and this looks somewhat normal. I just fit a basic curve to it that looks pretty Gaussian. But the curve that you get and the imagined distribution that you have really depends on your bin size and the number of samples you have. So I actually created this histogram from data that also can be plotted like this, which is really bimodal looking when you actually break up the bins into much smaller chunks. So this is not always the best way to go when you have a pretty complicated data set. And you want to be sure you're really using the correct distribution model. So is there some way that you could plot the distribution that's not a histogram, that's maybe more accurate? That's where the quantile-quantile plot comes in. What are quantiles? They're just a way of dividing a distribution into different sections, each of which has an equal probability of occurring. So you already know examples of different quantiles, such as halves or quarters. It's not a complicated concept. Um, but once you have a crazy distribution, it kind of be uh, difficult to think about how to divide it into quantiles. For example, if you have a non-normal distribution or a skewed distribution, the quantiles have to be divided in a way that might not look even on the x-axis. But just for a simple example, let's say you have um, some distribution that looks like this. You can easily have and quarter it. Something a little bit more complicated might be a distribution that looks like this. So you can see here that some of the bins have two items in them. And these are what we call ties. And you could still divide this one neatly in half as long as you've got the same number of ties in each quantile. And you can continue doing this if you've uh, still have the same number of tie, tie, ties in the quarter quantiles. So, to generate a QQ plot, you're basically going to put on your x-axis the percentiles that um, you predicted from the distribution that you want to match. So here it's the predicted percentile from a normal distribution. 
on the y-axis, you're going to have the percentile um, value for each quantile in your sample. So that would be like 0%, 50%, 100% for our halves, for example. And if when you plot the data on this, these two axes, you get a straight line, that means it matches the distribution on your x-axis. In this case, a normal distribution. And typically, people will think of quantile-quantile plots against the normal distribution, but you can do the same method using any other distribution on the x-axis. So here's an example using that data that I showed you in the last slide. I plotted the, um, this QQ plot here just using MATLAB's built-in function, and you'll see that the labels on these axes aren't exactly the percentiles. So on the x-axis, we've actually got the standardized quantiles, essentially the z-scores. And on the y-axis, I actually have the true values of the sample that I've input. So I put in values from 1 through 8. And instead of showing the percentiles, it's simply the values of the input data, but chunked into quantiles along the axis. So there's as many points as there are quantiles that we've sampled. Now you see this line looks pretty straight, but at the tails we see some deviations. So it's a little bit higher than the straight line on the very far left, and a little bit lower on the very far right. So if you are not an experienced um, viewer of QQ plots, you might conclude, yeah, it's roughly normal. But we know the distribution actually isn't normal. I passed in a uniform distribution. And if you actually make a QQ plot against the uniform distribution, you get a much straighter line. And like I said, you can just simply do this method using any type of distribution on the x-axis even a different distribution that doesn't have a model. So let's say you have a general population and you want to plot your sample um, from a different year on the y-axis. You can compare whether that sample matches the previous year's data on the x-axis. You'll notice this is still a subject subjective method. You're still assessing whether plot lines look roughly straight or not, and that's not a great way to test if you have a normal distribution. It is useful for an extreme deviation for normality. So here I'm showing you quantiles from a normal distribution versus exponential. And you see it's extremely deviated off of the straight line on this plot. But if you had just made a histogram, you would have seen an extremely non-normal distribution as well. And here's just another example um, of a non-normal distribution that's deviated, but it's a little more subtle. So this is that uh, example of a uniform versus a normal distribution as we discussed before. So now we come to hypothesis testing for distributions. Instead of just looking at some plots, you can actually generate a p-value using the hypothesis test methods that we reviewed in a previous lecture. So here the null hypothesis is that the sample distribution is of some distribution type, such as Gaussian or binomial. Like I said, the distribution type can be any type of um, distribution you choose. And Consequent, uh, consequently, there's a lot of different types of tests you can use to do this, and I'm going to review a few of the main ones here. First thing I'm going to talk about the Shapiro-Wilk test. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail about this. Here's the formula. You don't actually need to know it. You don't know, need to know a ton of the reasoning behind it. You're just typically going to use a built-in calculator and a statistical package to calculate the p-value for Shapiro-Wilk test. I'm just going to emphasize that the W here is the test statistic, and then there's a derived distribution of W values for the normal distribution that you're testing against, and you calculate a p-value in the way that we described before. Basically, people took some expected order statistics and expected covariance if you had a true normal distribution, and they made a huge table of them, if you calculate this formula after you plug in 
the mean of your sample and all of your sample data points, you'll get the W test statistic. Then there's a different test called the Lillefors test. This is something that's a little bit easier to understand at an intuitive level. What it does is it quantifies the distance between the empirical cumulative distribution and the normal distribution. Um, normal cumulative distribution distribution. <laughs> so here's an example. The empirical one is the sample that I'm telling you about, and the normal CDF that we're comparing against is this red dotted line. So the distance between these two curves is pretty small. So it looks like uh, the value for the low force test is going to be pretty, pretty low. So when I do this, it generates a test statistic, which is 0.08. Again, you're just going to use a little calculator to calculate the distance between these two curves. It gives you this test statistic, and then it compares it against some distribution of d values to calculate this p value. And here it's telling us it's pretty normal. We're, we've got a pretty high p value. Then there's a generalization of the Lillefors test, which is a kolmogorov smirov test. This is one you'll hear about a ton. Basically, you can compare your CDF to any CDF. Instead of using a normal CDF, you could use a binomial CDF, for example. You can even compare your CDF to other empirically collected CDFs. So like the QQ plot, instead of using a distribution um, quantile on the x-axis, for example, you could have used your uh, different samples um, quantile on the x-axis. Here, you can do the same thing. You can compute a CDF for a sample you collected on one day and then a sample you collected on a different day and compare to see if they look similar. And um, you can even modify this test to be a goodness of fit test. So basically you can check whether um, there are two CDFs that look similar enough to each other that it fits well. A similar test in this family is the Anderson-Darling test. It just uses a different dis dis distance metric between the two CDFs that weights the details of the distribution more he heavily. And as with all of these, you're just going to use the built-in calculator to calculate the test statistic for the Anderson-Darling test. As a reference, I put in a little um, link to a MATLAB tutorial at the very end of this lecture that was written by a couple of Stanford students for a t statistics class that they took. And it goes through all of these different distribution tests and shows you both how to calculate them in MATLAB and what the results are for a certain distribution. It's useful if you want to know more detail about these types of tests. So basically, here's a summary. To compare distributions, compare the CDFs of those distributions. You could do it by the quantile quantile plot by instead of a cumulative distribution, but it'll just be easier to use a hypothesis test such as the kolmogorov smirnov test to see the dis distance between the two um, CDFs that you're comparing. But maybe you don't trust these hypothesis tests. Or maybe your hypothesis just doesn't follow any model distribution that you know of. You plot it out, doesn't quite look normal, doesn't quite look binomial, and it has maybe a lot of outliers that don't really make sense. Well, then what do you do? This is where we turn to resampling methods. Basically, every time your distribution is super weird, you're going to turn to resampling. First, we're going to talk about how to resample descriptive statistics. So this is what happens, um, this is what you should do if the usual method for calculating descriptive statistics is biased somehow. That is, the description just totally sucks to at describing your data. So outliers can really influence descriptive statistics in a huge way. So let's say that you've got a distribution that looks kind of like this with this huge outlier over here. 
The mean is 5.4, but you can see both in the box plot and the distribution that most of the data is clustered over here, and it's just this one outlier that's probably pulling the mean higher. One of the central questions behind resampling is, what if you repeated your experiment many, many times? What we'd expect for that previous example is that the outlier be would become increasingly rare with increased sampling, and we know this given the central limit theorem. That is, as we get more samples, the entire distribution tends towards the center. So essentially, when we make our descriptive statistic, we want to minimize the influence of the outlier. And this is where we come to a type of resampling called bootstrapping. Now I'm just going to review the procedure for bootstrapping and explain how to interpret it in a couple examples that follow. So for a sample that has n elements, you're going to resample n elements with replacement. So you might remember this concept from Kathleen's lecture, but let's just go over a specific example. Let's say you have a sample that's from 1 to 5. When you resample it, you're going to want 5 elements again, but you can resample any one of these um, numbers many times. So the next iteration when you resample, you might get 2, 4, 4, 5, and 1. These are all elements from the original distribution, or the original set, but 4 is repeated twice. A different example might be 3, 2, 2, 5, 3. So you do this a bunch of times, and you calculate the mean of the sample every single iteration. So on this example that I just showed you with the outlier, I resampled 100 times. And now I'm showing you the distribution of the mean values every single sampling iteration binned into a histogram. And you'll see that this histogram skews leftward. That's because as you increase the number of samples, in this bootstrapping procedure, you're going to get very few samples that include the outlier. So you're going to have fewer, uh, fewer means that are towards the high end and more means towards the low end. Now, when you take the overall mean of this distribution, you'll see that it's actually lower than the mean of the sample that we uh, originally had that had that huge outlier. Because the center of this distribution, the central mass, is not as skewed towards the outlier. Now I'll show you bootstrapping again using some real data rather than something I generated in MATLAB. So I went to this website um, that's for the Nature Journal Scientific Data. This journal is simply one that publishes a bunch of data sets that scientists have with a bunch of the descriptive statistics and labels. So this is free for anyone to get, um, and you can reanalyze or just take their data for whatever meta-analysis or whatever other purposes you have. So I downloaded this data set because I just wanted something about cute animals. So I downloaded female and male life tables for seven wild primate species. And I'm going to show you some data about baboon lifespans. What I didn't realize until I started to make these slides and write the code was that this was a little bit sadder than I thought because it was mostly about when baboons die. And I took just a not super depressing part of this, this data set, which is um, the average mortality rate for each year of a baboon's life. And I've separated these into male and female, and these baboons were tracked for 24 years total. So each one of these values is mortality rate for, say, all 24-year-old baboons, all 23-year-old baboons, all 15-year-old ba baboons, etc., all the way down to zero. And you'll see that this distribution is skewed leftward. So basically, you're not going to have a high mortality rate at most of these ages. Now let's say we want to plot the mean of those distributions. We're going to have to bootstrap it. Because 
what we would have to do is take means of a bounded proportion measure. So you saw that all of these vary from zero to one. Nothing's lower than zero, nothing's higher than one, because it's essentially a proportion of the baboons. It's half the baboons, or 20% of the baboons, or 0% of the baboons. So this is definitely not normal because it has to be bounded. And as we know, it's skewed leftward. So here, if you just take the mean, it doesn't really have the same interpretation that it normally has when you take the mean of a normal distribution. The mean of a normal distribution describes the central point. Here, the mean would not really describe the central point. Then when you go to plot the error bars on this um, hypothetical plot that you're making of the mean values, you don't actually want to calculate the standard error of the mean, which is what people typically do to put errors on such plots. That's not going to give us any meaningful error bars because the standard error is based on some assumptions about how error is distributed about a normal mean. It's distributed symmetrically and it has um, some properties that are distributed sort of along this um, normal distribution. Okay, so what I did here was I bootstrapped these data and I am plotting 95% confidence intervals in this plot on the left. So I had the bootstrapped means, that's the mean of the bootstrap distribution for both females and males, and I'm showing you um, the point in the entire distribution that is at two and a half percent and 97 and a half percentile. So that is the 95% con confidence interval. A plot that you might see in other papers, which isn't as um, isn't as accurate, is uh, a plot showing the mean from the distribution that is not dis uh, bootstrapped. So it's not hugely different from the bootstrap mean, and the confidence intervals um, derived from an assumption of a normal distribution. So if you'll remember from my hy hypothesis testing problem set, you can get confidence intervals output from the t-test function, for example. And that's based on assumption of what the um, normal distribution looks like. It's symmetrically distributed, and so the error bars are the same height above uh, this bar and below the bar. And you can see that in some cases, like in the female case, these are larger than the um, bootstrap sample, and in other cases, they're about the same size or maybe smaller than the other one, like in the male example. Another thing you might see is people plotting the mean from the original distribution and the standard error of the mean. That's typically the default option in a lot of programming languages or plotting um, programs or functions. And you can see that the standard error of the mean here is really tiny compared to these 95% confidence intervals. And that's because it's really looking at um, the error that's only within a couple standard deviations. And that is often less than um, the 95% confidence intervals. And you might say, why does it matter which error bars we choose? These graphs all look really similar to each other. Well, the standard practice you should follow is that the error bar should always reflect the, st the statistical comparison you're going to make or that you're reporting. So let's say here I'm reporting the means between the males and the females, and I want to show that they're not that different. If I did a t-test, then I would probably show this on the far right, which is the real mean from the original distribution and the standard error of the mean, because those are the assumptions I made about the distribution when I did my t-test. But we all know that that's not really the proper test for this. So if we didn't do a t-test, you wouldn't want to do this at all. And really, you would want to do a bootstrapped test. So you would want to bootstrap the distributions and then somehow do a test on those. Now how do we do that? I'll review it in just a minute. But basically, 
You should never plot some error bars that are going to confuse your readers about this statistical comparison you make. So some people will say, oh, your error bars overlap. That means that your statistical, statistical test shouldn't have been significant. But that's only true if you're plotting 95% confidence intervals. Uh, so it's a complicated issue. You should just always make sure that you're going to follow this um, canonical rule. So, just repeating what I said earlier, if we were comparing the means across groups using some sort of non-parametric test, anything derived from a normal distribution assumption, such as 95% confidence intervals based on the t-statistic or the standard error of the mean, are just not helpful. So, how do you generate these confidence intervals? And... We're just going to review here, I made this slide twice, sorry, um, the resampling uh, bootstrapping procedure. So you just resample with replacement across all iterations. And um, a note I'll make here is that you have a huge number of unique combinations. So if you do this enough times, you will eventually reach the bound, and you'll do every single resampling iteration that's possible, but that would take a really long time. And that's, you're probably never gonna get there. Um, what that means is that you can get really precise p-values. So if you continue to resample and resample and resample, then your distribution is gonna be really well populated. And you can calculate really exact confidence intervals and p-values from these distributions. Just be sure that you're selecting your samples randomly when you do each iteration. I'll show you how to do that in MATLAB in just a second. So just to review back in Kathleen's lecture, you're going to do unordered replacement. So it's this far right corner here. Now, the great thing about resampling with replacement is that you can actually generalize from your sample. When you resample with replacement, you're essentially simulating a population based on what you've already collected. So essentially, this is like having an actual population. A hypothesis test, you'll remember, depends on assumptions of some type of distribution of the population. You're essentially just creating that distribution. So you can then say, based on the results of your bootstrapped distribution tests, whether or not um, your sample is representative of some effect that you might compare it against. So remember Fisher's data-driven p-values? He wanted to emphasize how many samples cannot be generalized to a population with a specific distribution. Therefore, focus on your data. But then Pearson said, you got to make error calculations before you collect data because that's the reasonable thing to do. And if you actually do assume a specific distribution, then you can generalize from the data you've collected. We're always going to have to um, derive some conclusions about the population given our limited sample. So why don't we just assume that up front, say that we're going to have some errors, and then go from there. Resampling is a really great middle ground between these two things because you can both generalize from your resample distribution in a data-driven way, and you can avoid making some assumptions that might not be true about your sample. Now there's another way of doing resampling that's not this bootstrapping method. There's one thing called jackknifing, which some of you might have heard of. And before the dawn of readily available computing power, you wouldn't be able to just randomly pick a bunch of samples. One, it's hard to generate a bunch of random numbers in the first place. And then two, you're going to have to do that so many times. Doing that by hand sounds awful. What if you had to take the mean of 5,000 different iterations? You can do that in a couple minutes on a computer. Not so much with pen and pencil. What people did back way back in the day, and still some people do now for different reasons, um, is to take 
everything but one of your samples to estimate the parameter of interest. So let's say you're trying to calculate the mean, for example, the bootstrapped mean, in this case would become the jackknifed mean. You're going to take all but one of your samples, take the mean of that, and then do it a bunch of times. Essentially, you're leaving one out every single time. And then you're going to average across all the estimates you have, just like we did before when you, we created the bootstrap distribution and tried to find the mean of the bootstrap distribution. Here you're finding the mean of the jackknifed distribution. So let's just look at an example equation that describes the jackknife frame procedure. When you calculate the mean, you're going to have um, this variable here x sub i. So i denotes the held out sample. x is the mean of your of um, this particular sample. And you're going to take all of the other samples, which are denoted by j, sum across them, and then divide by the total number of samples minus 1. That gives you the mean. Pretty simple equation, right? And you can do the same procedure for any other descriptive statistic you might want such as variance or whatever you could bootstrap to. And this is a lot simpler than um, bootstrapping because it doesn't require the generation of random numbers and it has a finite end. Jackknife estimates are also generalizable to the population, but they are less powerful estimates than bootstrapping because there's a natural bound on the number of iterations you can get. So you're not going to get super precise estimates, but you'll get better ones and less biased ones than if you just did um, you know, a straight mean or straight variance calculation on um, a sample that is strangely distributed. And the last thing I'll just mention about jackknifing is that jackknifing is very useful when you're cross-validating a very complex model. Like if you're fitting a curve to a data set, often people will hold out one point in that data set, fit the curve to the rest of it, and then um, repeat over and over. You can ask me if you want more detail about that. I'm going to talk about it somewhat in the next lecture. Um, and often, this is the context you'll often find um, jackknifing in in just more recent or modern literature. So you should just keep that in mind. So one thing that's cool about both bootstrapping and jackknifing as resampling methods is that you can just conduct a one sample test based on this distribution that you generate. You just take your bootstrapped or jackknife distribution and you compare it to the desired value that you want. So let's say you're doing, you wanted to do a t-test against zero, but you had some weird distribution. You'd bootstrap it and then you see how much of your distribution falls um, between zero and the tail. So you can still calculate a p-value, and just like we saw in the hypothesis testing lecture, we're going to calculate the p-value based on the proportion of samples that are less than or greater than the test value. So for this example here with the baboon lifespans, this is the actual distribution of the female baboon mortality rate that I got when I did the bootstrapping. So to generate this bar on the left, I took the mean of this um, distribution. And if I wanted to do a one sample test, let's say I wanted to see if it was significantly different than zero, I would calculate the number of samples that are between zero and the tail of the distribution. In this case, it's zero. So the p-value is zero because some baboons die every single year, no matter what you do. Conversely, you could test the other side of the distribution. Let's say you wanted to see if it was at least one quarter or more. So you could um, then calculate the number of samples that's to the right of 0.25 and then see what proportion of it um, is greater than 0.25, and that would give you your p-value. As a summary, resampling your data allows you to correct for bias. Bias in estimates of your data, bias in descriptive statistics, and so on. And resampling also allows you to generalize your sample to a greater population. So the second part of the lecture that we'll talk about are randomization tests. These also utilize resampling. 
but I'm going to generally refer to them as randomization or permutation tests because they're a more specific term for what I'm going to talk about. So when would you use randomization tests? If you don't want to assume normality, but you still want to do some kind of hypothesis test, you can turn to randomization. This is basically just another way to resample a test statistic. And also, if you just wanted to make up your own statistical measure, you could do this through a randomization test or through resampling. So I'm going to be talking about um, how you generate a p-value from a t-statistic without referring to the canonical t-distribution. So if you remember, the t-statistic for the one sample test is simply by simply a difference of means um, divided by sample standard deviation and the square root of um, the number of elements in your sample. This essentially is just difference in means divided by a measure of sample variance. So this test so far doesn't really seem to depend on a normal distribution. None of these things really assume normality. You can create, uh, calculate a mean without calculating, um, without assuming normality. You can calculate variance and estimate how many um, things are in your sample without doing any of those things. So why did I say it depended on a normal distribution? Well, because somebody derived the distribution with that assumption. And just as a quick side note, that somebody was a guy who went by the pseudonym student, which is why it's called student's t-test. And he actually was a brewer who worked at Guinness as a scientist and then um, went off and did a sabbatical with some statistician, either uh, Pearson or Fisher derived the t-distribution and then wanted to publish a paper, but Guinness said he couldn't because it would give an unfair advantage to the other brewers. So he published it under the name student because he was somebody's student. Anyway, let's get back to the actual lecture. What if we just forgot the normal distribution assumption altogether? The t-statistic can still be used as a perfectly fine way to summarize your data and compare across groups as long as you believe that comparing the means is useful. You know, if you have two things which seem to be roughly symmetrically distributed, a mean is still fine to use. So basically you're just going to make up your own null t distribution. And how do you do this? Let's say you have two groups, for example, A and B, and they each have 30 samples. Um, I'm just going to show you this for a paired sample t-test, even though I know we just talked about a one sample t-test, because it'll be a little more helpful once we keep going in the next lecture. So you calculate a t-statistic using these two groups, just the normal way, and the null distribution that you want is the set of t-values you get if there's no difference between the groups, right? So somebody derives that assuming those two samples were normal, but we can just resample that. That's the idea. We are going to create a null distribution if there was no difference between the groups. So what we do is we shuffle the labels between groups A and B, basically mix them all up, and essentially we're making no difference between the groups. We're just mashing them together and then randomly dividing them in half. Then we calculate the t statistic again, and now it should be wildly different from what it was before. And we do that a bunch of times, and essentially we're going to get a null t distribution. So I'm going to show you how to do this in MATLAB. I want you guys to actually open up MATLAB and follow along with me, because it's going to be really helpful for a problem set in class if you actually know a lot of the core programming concepts that come along with resampling. So let's pop into MATLAB. Okay, so here's my MATLAB window. All of you should have this file. It's just called week 05 MATLAB example. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to seed the random number generator. So remember I said that when you resample with replacement, you want to do it randomly. And the way that MATLAB does this is it has a little thing that spits out a bunch of random numbers. They're not truly, truly random. They're pseudo-random, but they're really close to actually random. 
And the way that these work is that they essentially follow some crazy path through number space that I don't totally understand at all. And there's many different ways of doing it, but essentially it starts at a certain point in space and depending on the point it starts at, it will take a unique path each time. So you can seed the random number generator with any number you want. Generally, for really important analyses, you want to save out the seed that you're going to use because if you use the same seed the next time, you're going to get the same results running this, the analysis code you had before. But if you were doing anything else in which you wanted to do it actually random every single time, you can just seed it based on something that continuously changes. So what people will often do is seed the random number generator using, let's say, some number based on the current time of day or the current um, date and time. So I'm just defining a random seed here. You can use any number you want. If you want to see the exact same results as I do, you can use this random seed. Then to see the random generator, you want to use this function rng, and the input will just be the random seed number that you have. If you have a different version of MATLAB, especially a much older one, you might need to do something slightly different to see the random number generator. So just read the help file for your um, random number generator, and you'll be able to figure that out. Okay, so for this example, I'm just going to make a bunch of data. And you can do this along with me. If you use the same seed, you'll get the same exact data. The first distribution has a mean of 5, and the next one has a mean of 3. So then we're going to just see if these two are similar groups. And we're going to calculate this um, t-statistic using the t-test2 function. So if you'll remember, this is not the paired t-test, but the two-sample t-test. So we're not assuming that there's any paired ordering between these two samples, y1 and y2. Then I don't need any of the other stuff like the hypothesis test result or the p-value. So in order to just not save those variables, you can just insert a tilde where that normal variable will go. If you don't know where that key is on your computer, it's above probably the tab key. And I will just save out this stats structure, and in there is the actual t statistic. So I'm saving that out in a variable real t. Then what I do is I create a bunch of labels for each group. So first I combine these two groups into one big vector. So currently it's just 20 values in Y1 and 20 values in Y2. Let me actually run this code real quick so I can print it out for you. And Y1 looks like this. And Y2 has a bunch of values like this. I just printed them down the command window for you. So what I want to do is concatenate y1 and y2. So if I use this command cat, and then I pass in the dimension I want to concatenate along, which is the second dimension here, I will get a variable all y, if you look in the workspace over here on the left, that's now 1 by 40 rather than 1 by 20. So I just stack those two things on top of each other. Now 40 values are in all y. Then I also want to create an associated vector of group labels. And the first 20 should be 1, corresponding to group 1. And the second 20 should be 2, corresponding to 2. So in order to do that, I will use this function called 1s. And this just creates a really long vector of whatever size you input that's a bunch of 1s. So here you can just see all of these are 1s. And... If you do that same thing and multiply it by 2 at the very end, whoops, you will get a bunch of 2s. So then I concatenate those in the same way, and then I get group labels that is a 40 element vector that contains 1s and 2s, labeling the all y vector. Then I want to loop through a bunch of times and randomly resample or I don't actually mean resample, randomly shuffle the data labels. I wrote this in a hurry, sorry guys. 
you'll receive the correct version. So first you initialize your variable. You don't have to do this step, it'll just make it a lot easier for you and faster for your computer. Basically, I'm, I'm making a variable that's empty, that has a bunch of null values or not a numbers, which are NANDs. And this vector is going to be of the size that I specify. So I want to do 100 iterations. So null t will be 100 values. So I'm just going to print it out in this window below. Just going to take a second. Oh, I didn't define in iterations. I can do this. I can mouse. And now it's a bunch of not a numbers. So then you're going to want to write a for loop. If you've never written a for loop before, the concept is super simple. All you do is loop through a bunch of times for x number of times. The canonical way to do it is to name the variable i for each iteration of the for loop. And in MATLAB, the syntax is pretty simple. It's for space i equals one colon um, and the end of the vector that you want. So this is essentially the variable iter the iterator variable that's equal to one of these values on every single iteration. This goes from one to a hundred. So on every single iteration which is what you're going to have inside the for loop before the end, you're going to want to shuffle the data labels for each group. And um, in order to do this, you're going to use a function called randperm. And randperm shuffles a bunch of numbers from 1 to n. So here, just run this line of code on line 39, randins. And the input here is the number of elements in the group labels vector. So if you just run that, it's got 40 elements, like we said before. And when I run randperm of 40, I get 40 numbers. That's just 1 through 40 mixed up in order, in any order. So that's what randperm does for you. And I'm going to save that out to this variable called randins. And then I'm going to create a new variable that's a bunch of randomly labeled groups. So all I have to do is index the group labels vector that we made before with this randins vector. And now what I'll do is mix up all those ones and twos so that they're in a random order. And you save that out to our lab. So now you're going to run your t-test. And you're going to run your t-test with... Um, some random values from all, all y. And you're going to use the r lab vector that you just created to index all y. So instead of taking the first 20 values and the last 20 values, you're going to take some of them that, uh, some of the randomly labeled ones that are all equal to one. So that would be the, um, the pretend one group that you're making as you're shuffling all these things. And then the ones that are equal to two, which is the pretend two group as you're shuffling all these things. If you're having trouble following along with this um, little MATLAB example, I highly suggest that you play around in MATLAB with all these commands that I'm talking about. It will really, really help, I swear. And it's going to be important for the problem set. So please, please, please actually do this in MATLAB and play around when you don't quite know what's going on. So when we index all y with... Um, this logical statement, which is all of um, the R lab vector, which equals one, you're going to get 20 values. So only 20 of R lab is equal to one, and it'll be a random order, just like R lab is a random order. And then you're gonna do the same thing for the second group and just take all the other values, which are all of R lab that are equal to two. Then you're going to do that same line of code that you had up here, which is the t-test between the two um, correctly labeled groups. So you do that t-test, you get out the new um, statistics table, and then you save out that t-statistic from this t-test into the variable we populated with NANDs. So now the null t variable is going to have this t-statistic for the ith iteration. So for the first one, 
because I equals one right now, or it will in just a second, <laughs> um, we are going to get a null t that is equal to, let's go all the way to the top, negative 0 0.2460. So I do this a hundred times. So let me just run this code all the way through to that cell. And now you've got a distribution of t values, the null distribution. If you're curious about what it looks like, you can run this little snippet of code to make a distribution. And this is your null t distribution. And here with this blue line, I've plotted where the original t value is. And you can see it's towards the right tail of the distribution, and it could be significant. It's not somewhere in the center. So the last thing we're going to do is to calculate the p-value. OK, so how do we actually calculate the p-value? We're basically just going to look at the proportion of the distribution that lies in each tail. So if we go back to that figure with the histogram, we'll see that on um, the left tail, for example, we're going to want to know all of the values of the null distribution which are less than this real, real t value here in blue. So we have this statement, null t less than real t, which compares every single value in null t to the single value real t. So that will return you a bunch of values which are the size of the larger vector, null t. So that gives you a bunch of ones and zeros. One indicating yes, null t is less than real t in this instance, or zero indicating no, it is not. So if you take the mean of this entire vector, you're going to get a proportion of the distribution which is less than a real t. In this case, it's a lot of it. It's 0.95. Then we're going to calculate the other tail by just reversing the sign of this logical statement. So if we do that, the right tail is the remainder, which is 0 0.05 or 5%. To find the tail with the minimum area underneath the distance, you're just gonna run min of these two statements. And basically this is just saying you wanna find um, the tail that's the more reasonable tail, the one that's smaller. So the one-tailed P in this case is 0 0.05. And if you want to calculate the two-tailed t value in this case, you're just going to do the same thing and calculate the one-tailed t value, one-tailed p value by two. So that would give you 0.1. And just to help you out, um, this is the same thing that I just explained, but in one line of code. So you can just put it all on one line without saving out all those extra variables. It's a little more confusing to walk through when you're a beginner um, programmer, but this might help in the future for you to just look at. So the thing I really like about resampling is that you can really apply the methods I just talked to you about with any single measurement that you want. These resampling methods that we that we reviewed, um, both with replacement, with bootstrapping, and without replacement, with shuffling, or the randomization test, are all examples of the Monte Carlo method to simulate probabilistic events without deriving mathematical expressions to describe them. Now I'm just giving you this term, Monte Carlo method, because you'll also see this in a bunch of papers that you read in method sections and such, um, describing the exact same phenomena I just told you about. So someone will say, I did a bunch of Monte Carlo simulations to calculate the p-value. So they could have done bootstrapping if they were doing a one sample test, or they could have done um, label shuffling, which is like a random randomization or permutation test like we just did in MATLAB. And they would call this a Monte Carlo simulation. And Actually, the critical value tables for those normality tests that we talked about at the very beginning of the lecture, like the Lillifors and Kolmogorov Smirnoff and Anderson Darling, Shapiro Wilkes, they often have no derivable mathematical expression for them. Someone just came up with this useful seeming test statistic, and then they used resampling to derive this distribution of the test statistic. These are just derived through Monte Carlo simulations. This is a very 
um, pervasive method and statistics that now you know how to use. It's actually really simple. So in the next lecture, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about model validation and how you can use resampling methods to validate models that you've made, such as a GLM or a um, curve fit to some data that you have. So as a final review, I'm just going to put up this little Venn diagram that shows you some of the terms that we've reviewed today. Like I said, there are resampling methods, and then there is this other family of methods that people refer to as Monte Carlo methods. While there's some overlap between the two, which is mostly what we've re reviewed today, there's also some Monte Carlo methods that we haven't talked about at all. And I wanted to define the relationships between all these terms because it can get a little confusing when you know some of them, but not all of them. So today we focused on the green circle, the resampling methods, and that included things like jackknifing your sample, and um, can also involve things like cross-validating your model, which is what we're going to review in the next lecture. And some of these resampling methods were also Monte Carlo methods. So at the bottom here, I've listed the couple that we reviewed in this lecture, which include bootstrapping, which is resampling a bunch of times um, in order to get a certain distribution, as well as the um, method for creating null distributions of a test statistic that we did for the randomization tests. So these are Monte Carlo methods because you're simulating repeated draws from a known distribution. And um, anytime you simulate a process many, many times um, in order to uh, derive some model of the population, you're, getting, you're doing a Monte Carlo method. So something that we didn't talk about is simulating draws from a distribution with a known formula. So basically you have a formula for the d distribution and you could, for example, simulate that um, distribution many, many times. So when you're simulating spiking from a Poisson model, for example, you're doing a Monte Carlo simulation. But that's not really um, the resampling that we've talked about today because you have a known formula for that already. So you're not resampling from a distribution that you've collected. You're just resample, you're just drawing simulated um, draws from a distribution with a formula. Monte Carlo methods are also used for other things like um, models of mo molecular interaction. Let's say you wanted to model um, how ion channels exchange um, sodium and potassium. You can do this with a Monte Carlo simulation that defines a bunch of probabilities of things crossing um, the membrane through the ion channel and do that a bunch of times um, through simulation. So that's a Monte Carlo method which a lot, with a lot of defined parameters, but it's not resampling in the least. So it can get a little confusing, but um, you can remember that Monte Carlo is the big uh, simulation, basically, methods, and resampling are the methods that um, take from the distribution or the sample that you've already collected. Okay, so thanks for watching the lecture. I'm just going to put up a few references here at the end. Um, I have some references to the distribution test statistics that we talked about at the very beginning. And this is the data from that baboon lifespan um, paper. And also I have a couple of references for... Um, other things that you might be interested in reading, such as the derivation of the t-distribution, which we talked about a little bit, and that tutorial for all of the different normality tests. All right, I'll see you next lecture.